It always amazes me the quality of what people deliver here with their skills and gifts and singing and drama. And Amen. You know, it really is, really is good. And uh, I'm so glad to be part of it. You know, we, we're on this journey talking about parenting this morning. And uh, it's a big subject because having a baby is the easiest part of being a parent. After that, that's when it gets hardest. There's great challenges. And like the guy said earlier, you don't get an instruction manual with them when they arrive. Not that it would matter with most men because they never read the instruction manuals. In any case, as parents, we face an extraordinary complex and we face a stressful world which has made parenting in some ways a little harder. In the days when people lived in the country and didn't have cities like we have, it was far easier to parent in some ways because the family business, the family life, everything you did together. And so everything revolved around the nuclear family, but it no longer does. Let's not kid ourselves. No, what do we have? We had the father here wasn't even giving family time. You know, we have issues that occur. And to make things worse, there's a lot of people really struggling to make ends meet. As some of us here, the family comprises of only one adult because of unfortunate circumstances. It's one of the ways that, that things happen. You see, the reality is our family needs us to look up and to see what it's all about. And I found this little slide uh, today. Some parents approach to raising their family is not very good, is it? You know? It can be difficult. But we even make it even more difficult sometimes. Let, let, let's think for a moment about some of the thoughts that I have here. Dear Mum and Dad, there's a letter from your children. Dear Mum and Dad, you told us stories about Jasmine being in a relationship with a dirty homeless boy called Aladdin. Noddy calling people names like Big Ears and Gollywog. The Pied Piper who led children astray because parents repu refused to pay their bills. Rapunzel using her hair, long hair to sneak men into her bedroom. <laughs> Grabbing other people's fruit off their trees and calling it scrimping instead of stealing. You taught us Snow White was living alone with seven men and that that was okay. <laughs> and the worst thing about that was that some of them were people with major character flaws, and it was still okay. <laughs> Robin Hood was a thief, and you made his misfit friends look good. Tarzan walked around without clothes or footwear, and he was great. A stranger kissed Sleeping Beauty and then married her really quickly. <laughs> and Cinderella was lying and sneaking out at night to go to a party against her guardian's orders. And now you want me to, to act in a different way. What have you been teaching me, mum and dad? And you see, that's the reality so often. Some parents get so frustrated they don't know what to do, and so they resort to all sorts of methods, and problem solved. <laughs> see, the reality is that, the reality is for every one of us, that many people are parents, and for those of you who are not parents here, and, and maybe never will be, or maybe your children have grown up or whatever, it doesn't stop any of us from being able to help people on the journey. You see, we're in this together. When you're in a community of God's people, we're here to give each other support and assistance. That doesn't mean to say you have the right to override a parent, as I had happened to me some many years ago, but that, that we do give each other support, the right kind of attitude, the right kind of support. See, many people are parents, but fewer people really are successful parents. And as the guys said before on the, on the little video clip, we want to learn from that. Here's another person. The guy's going to turn the sound up on this. There's a little video clip. Let's, let's listen to what this guy says. My wife Amy and I have got five children that we've been blessed with. All those years spent, in a way, I mean, I hate to say it, in a way, married We're only my hearing. job, and in a way, fathering my my job, my church, more than the souls that were entrusted to me. I mean, that definitely would be my parenting low point. Well, we live in an age of delegation parenting. If I, as a parent, want my kid to learn math, I get him a tutor. If I want him to learn basketball, I get him a coach. If I want him to learn Jesus, 
I take him to church. My job as a parent then is to drive the bus to all these different places. And I, I don't have any problem with tutoring. I don't have any problem with coaching. And I love Sunday school and youth group. But this role and this responsibility of impressing the hearts of our kids with a love for God just isn't one that can be delegated. The overwhelming responsibility that we have uh, felt for the spiritual lives of our children has really driven me uh, to explore and to discover all that God's Word has to say about the role of the family in the lives of our kids. You go through cover to cover in the Bible, you find the home, the home, the home. For me as a dad, uh, you tell me, okay, my responsibility is to nurture faith in the hearts of my kids. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I need help. I need ideas. I need creativity. I need resources. I need encouragement. I need inspiration. God loves your family. God wants to take your family with all of its problems, with all of its imperfections, with all of its struggles, and turn your family into a discipleship center. Turn your home into a worship center. Amen? I don't know what happened to his face. It disappeared, but never mind. The words were the most important thing. You see, the reality is, is in his own story, he was too busy to parent. And sometimes we get just way too busy to parent. You see, because the reality is that our decisions affect everyone in our family. Absolutely every single person in our family gets affected by our decisions. And that's, that is a reality that goes beyond what we always understand. You see, just one decision will affect really badly sometimes. Pardon me, ginger beer. The scripture says these words. The person who brings trouble on their family will inherit only wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise. You know, the proverb is so, uh, is so clear on this one. You know, when we bring trouble to the family, it often simply comes about because of bad decisions. You know, you notice a song that, that uh, Nick and May sang before and our team played for us. You know, the words were so resoundingly clear in that song, don't give up now, now because miracles happen. Because what? Yeah. So even if things have been really tough for you, I just want us this morning, sit back and relax and say, I'm going to have a good time from today onwards. We're going to have a great time in the family. You see, the best basis for every one of us <clears throat> of spiritual training is the Bible. That's why we're here as a Christian community. If you're a guest here this morning, I want to commend you for having the courage to come. You're always welcome. The basis of, of, of spiritual training is the Bible. Parents are instructed to rely upon it for truth. Values, principles, and directions as they nurture their children. And the Bible has a lot to say about parenting. It shows all sorts of bad models and, and, and makes comment often about those models. What happens when a parent uh, does things that causes their children to suffer? It goes down the generations and it talks about actually what is actually happening in that process. So every one of us needs to be aware of the fact that really... One of the best books around on this whole subject, and by far it's not the only book, is the Bible. You've just got to find the stuff there. Let's have a look at a scripture, and just one scripture that we're going to look at here this morning, really clearly, subject. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the w words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, what we have heard and known what our fathers have told us. You see the emphasis here. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds uh, of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed uh, statutes for Jacob and established the law uh, <clears throat> In, in Israel, which he commanded to our forefathers to teach their children. And it continues. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Now it finishes with a bit of a negative thing. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts 
were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. You see, the picture that's being painted here is that when you tell your children things, they pass it on to their children, and they pass it on to their children. So what does it actually say to us? For those of you who haven't had children yet, get thinking now, what are you going to pass on to your children? And what have you been passing on if you're already a parent or a grandparent or whatever? What are the things that you pass on? You know, every time I pick up little Jesse, my grandson, I bless him. That's a very, very intentional thing. I, I, I bless him. I tell, I tell him that he's a blessing, that, that God loves him. I tell him those things that are special. I tell him how much I love him. A little man comes running over, and uh, yesterday, the first time this happened, he's got two little teeth, and I hadn't seen them before, and I was totally surprised. He comes running over, throws his arms up, and I pick him up, and he just, he, he'd never done this to me before. He just hugged me and hugged me and held me and held me real tight into my neck. He'd never done it before. And I thought, you know, it's so amazing how a child that size will trust you totally and will hug at that kind of depth. You know, there was something happening. There was some connection. And, you know, really God wants us to know that that's the kind of love he has for us. And he wants our children to experience it as well. He wants every one of our children to experience that kind of love. That's why it's so clear in the beginning of that verse we read, Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. Because God wants us to hear him. God wants us to know him, to experiencing him. So in terms of this, I want to talk about uh, the whole thing of parenting. And, and, and I want to suggest that we be a great uh, role model, an awesome role model, a high-level role model. And that in, in terms of that, I want to just say um, that we'd be great models. Who, and I want to ask this question. Who do you want your family to emulate in their lives, a famous person who fails or you? I have been so amazed sometimes in the church when I've heard little stories of, um, of the fact that the, the, the children in the church sometimes, even though people know better, that their children are following um, secular people in the world, actors or singers or whatever, who are awful people, who are not good role models. And they say, you can aspire to be like that, Johnny. I hope there's no Johnny. Oh, it's apart from my son-in-law. You know, Bertie. I don't think there's any Berties here, right? You can aspire to be like that person, Bertie. What's the message you're saying? What you're trying to say is you could act like that person, but the truth of the matter is they will act like that person in more ways than just on stage. See, the models we set up are the models our children will follow. And, and that's the reality. So, you know, you know, sports characters, actors, singers, whatever it happens to be, we should be the best model for our children, not somebody else. And, and uh, if you're aspiring that they become somebody famous, I want to suggest something. Don't. I think it's the worst thing you can do for your child because I have seen many a child whose parents have driven them and driven them. They have aspirations for their children, but often it destroys the soul of their child because they're not able to make their own decisions. They're not able to process who they are. They're trying to perform to who their parents want them to be. That's a very different thing, and it's a very dangerous thing, whether you know it or not. You see, the reality is, in terms of this, that um, you are number one role model. You know, they will copy you. And uh, pushing off responsibility to somebody else isn't a good thing at all. In reality, you can be people who show them how you live and how you do the right things in life, even when you are challenged. So even when things go wrong, how do you respond? Because your children are watching. If your response is to, so, to something that's going wrong is to get all angry and verbal around the house and go on shouting and yelling and bashing the wall or, or kicking the cat or whatever, guess what your children are going to do? And the worst thing about it, historically, is that children don't get better, they get worse. I certainly saw that happen in my family. It was kind of sad, really. 
So I just want to give you an insight just a little quickly into, and I want to be quick here this morning on this because it's only an introduction. It's a 101 parenting thing. I want to look at parenting styles. Now, if you look at the boxes around the outside, you look at high acceptance and low acceptance and low control and high control. Now, here are the four models that have been identified. These these have been identified by those who specialize in studying this whole subject. They're in diet... Uh, indulgent parents who give their children high acceptance, but they don't give them any control. They don't give them any direction in life. Those kids get into trouble. Those kids are going to get into trouble. There's just no way that you can afford, uh, uh, avoid it, you see. See, the, the, the problem is that uh, that indulgence is actually going to uh, overindulgence is going to spoil that child, and that child's not going to function well in society. is isn't going to function well because people won't just keep giving them things. The second group, low acceptance and low control, where parents are really not engaged with their children. They're not spending time with them. They're not helping them. They're not working with them on their school projects or whatever it is that, that you need to be there for your parents for. And what actually happens when that happens, that child ends up disengaged in society, ends up disengaged from the parents. And the parents say, what did I do wrong? You didn't do enough. If you're disengaging. Third one I want to touch on is authoritarian. They have high control and low acceptance. You will do what I say. <laughs> no, the reality is authoritarian people uh, alienate their children. They say the children end up just really alienated. A parent thinks they're doing the best thing for the kids because that's their motivation. But motivation and method are two different things. You see, motivation may be great, but the method may be really destructive and you destroy the soul of your child. You know, you see it, <coughs> see it um, consistently with the authoritative thing. When a child's really little, you've got to have quite a lot of authority. Aren't we agreed? Amen? When they get to 10 years old, they are starting, or around that age, sometimes a little later, sometimes a little earlier, they're starting to try and make decisions. If you quash them, if you squash their thinking and their processes and don't help them to, to develop good processes, if you're the decision maker... From that point on in their life, I can tell you what's going to happen. They will not function well. Parents are convinced if if I tell them all the right things, I make them do all the right things, then they're going to be the right kind of person. I want to tell you now, they will lose the ability. They will not develop the ability to be able to make decisions healthily. So when they become young adults, one of the things that happens when young adults, when an authoritative parent comes in, you know, authoritarian parent rather, uh, comes in on, on the, on the uh, young adult and says, you'll do this because I say so because you're part of this family. And if a parent, the mother or the father, works like that, I can tell you right now, you're going to suffer rejection. You're going to suffer problems. You're going to suffer issues. That's what will actually happen. And those issues will grow bigger than you ever, ever dreamed or imagined. You see, I don't think the authoritarian uh, <clears throat> is always badly motivated. There are some that are. They're often well motivated, but, but the mechanisms are very bad for the child because the, it's not helping them develop. You see, our role as parents is to help our child from the time they're born to the time uh, we, we no longer have responsibility for them, is to help them develop, not to control the environment. There's a big difference between the two things. Then the last one, the authoritative one person. This person it has high acceptance of their child and high control. Now, what do I mean by high control by this? This is not being controlling. This is, this is quite a different thing altogether. In this situation, <clears throat> they have high control because they've modeled so well that their child wants to be like them. They talk about issues so well that their child wants to be like them. I've, now and again over the years, I've had parents come to me and say, my old child doesn't want to do what I'm telling him to do. And I... I sit there and I feel really squirmy and uncomfortable because sometimes their child's talk to me. And I'm sort of, if you want to make me uncomfortable, come and say something like that to me. <laughs> but uh, please don't, but you know what I mean. And, and, uh, and, and I'm sometimes aware of the fact that their child has been to me and says, I don't want to be like mum or my dad. Or my grandma or my 
grandpa or whoever's raising them. I, I just don't want to be like that. And the parent doesn't always see it. And it's not because the child's feeling, uh, hates their parents or anything stupid like that. It's just that they want to make their own decisions. And they do have a right in the biblical framework to do so. To learn to do so and for us as parents to teach. So I want to move into an area of this not always talked about in books. In fact, quite often not talked about in books. It's the whole thing, uh, learning to be worshippers at home. We're going to be later in here doing a whole uh, series on the subject at, at a far deeper level. But I just want to touch on a couple of things. Real worshippers at home <coughs> end up, if they are real worshippers of God, and that, that they're being real, they're not just turning up here on Sunday and worshipping and then the rest of the week they're not. Real workers at home see great results in their family. We have this little story of a guy who was a, a, a Roman um, um, centurion who led an Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. <coughs> he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision, distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, and Cornelius stared at him in fear, what is it, Lord? He asked. And out of that story came this amazing story where he... Um, he had heard God. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't, he did, we don't even know whether he really understood anything about Jesus. Although Jesus had already just lived not long in the land, long ago in the land. He probably heard stories, but probably didn't understand the context. And, and what happened, because he was so God-fearing, in the end, his whole family and his neighbors who came got really touched by the power of God and the love of God. That was the end result of the story. You see, the reality is that this guy was a real worshipper of God, even though he didn't have the advantages we have in today's society in terms of that. He was making a decision that he wanted to know God and wanted to honor God, and so God really blessed his family. It was a great outcome. You see, the place church has in family will define your children. The place. I was talking a bit with a group the other day, and I decided I had to put this in the thing, even though they, they heard this thing the other day. Each day you spend a majority of time in certain places. Each day you spend. And the two primary places are work and home. The other, they have the first two places. Okay? So it's work and home. Now the question is, and this is a really big question in terms of this, what is your third place? What is your third place that you spend time in with your children? And a lot of people in the church actually would be like this. It would be school, sport, school, hobby, relaxing, travel, um, all sorts of things as their third place. And research has shown something very, very interesting on the subject. The third place that you play, have will be the thing that will impact your life. The first two places have no uh, no, difference because they're normal parts of life but the third place is choice church should be your third place there's a reason for that because when it's not there's an outcome that you probably wouldn't like I know and I've watched over the years and I've bled and I've tried talking with people but it's like talking to the hand you know you know the things people say hey talk to the hand I don't hear you know it's like talking to the hand. I, I, have, I, have, I have pleaded with some people to be careful on this issue. In Porirua, at the big issue that pops up, and it happens in other, other parts of New Zealand as well, but more in Porirua and, and Otara um, in particular than probably most other places in New Zealand. There's probably other places that are close to it. Sport has been the god of our society. And parents want their kids to be all blacks or... <clears throat> or Hurricanes players, I don't know why, but, you know, <laughs> you know, if you want to play for the Crusaders, I'd understand, but, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> only kidding, I'm only kidding, okay, I peace, all right? <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, when that becomes our third priority, guess what? It destroys our children's spirit. <coughs> I want to suggest something. Society will keep demanding more and more and more of your kids. 
They say you have to be at two practices every week. I would suggest that if a lot of people turn around and said, that is too much in terms of sport, that I would rather have my children twice at church than twice at sport and once at church, then it would be a different deal. And the research is very, very clear about this. The third pri place priority you put will be the thing that will influence your children the most. The other two are just normal things. So obviously home and work are, are the highest values and highest importance. But it's that third place that I want to talk about. In terms of connecting a family with God, uh, family times with God are not opportunities, listen to this, to get at or address issues or wrongdoing in family members' lives. You know, <coughs> Pauline's mum used to do a classic on this, and uh, we chuckled about it later in, in life when she got older and all the rest of it. But they used to, she used to, they used to get, and they used to have, you know, get together and get the meal table to pray, and, and dear Lord Jesus, I pray you'll forgive Pauline for being naughty today, and, you know, and that was the kind of thing that happened. Now, I'm sure there was no wrong intention in that, but the damage it did to my wife's soul was not good. The damage it did to her soul was awful. Because, you see, family time for, with God is, is, is about listening to God, not listening to your parents. Now, I want to be serious about that. We think we have the primary role in parenting. We have the, we have the, the responsibility to parent well, but God's the primary parent. He is our Father who lives in heaven. Isn't that true? You see, that's a priority. We don't say, dear mum and dad, who lives on earth. We say, our Father who lives in heaven, and he's all our Father. And so there's some degree where we do need to, we, yeah, we need to address issues, but where do we do it and when do we do it? That's actually really important. So, charging on. So there should be no statements, prayers, attitudes, digs at, at the children or, <coughs> uh, or um, speaking one person up above the others. That's actually a big issue in some parts of society to make a port or to give an attitude. Let, let, me, let me explain what that means. I, can't, I couldn't sit there and say, you know, if you were like your sister, don't do that. You're setting the children up for conflict with each other and you're setting them up for resentment to each other and towards you. They are different to each other. Every child is. And if you set them one against the other, the problems you're creating are huge, are humongous. And I cannot overemphasize that. A number of times I've ended up counseling people in, in, in the adult age group and when I've dug deep with them, one of the big issues that pops up is this very issue. Over and over and over again. There's this whole thing, and the resentment builds up. Faith, I want to suggest, should never be private. It should never be private. Our girls always knew what we believed and why we believed what we believed. Our girls, actually, I just had a compliment made about Johanna over the weekend in relation to this, and Adele is, is well-skilled in this area as well, and, and Sailor is, is, is a great thinker too in, in terms of these things. I had a compliment made because somebody had met Johanna, and this is a theological, um, um, one of the top lecturers in our college. He said to me, wow, your daughter really understands the faith and she understands the theology. That comes out of the home. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Healthy theology comes out of the home if, we live, if, we, if our faith is being shared. And so we need to talk about your daily journey with God, <coughs> with all of your family. Now, not your daily grumps. Not your attitude towards other people in the church who you need to sort out about in, in terms of yourself. It really is about talking about your daily journey with God. What are you doing? How are you talking with God? What are the things you're struggling with? And you need to, in the journey of that, make God your hero in your stories. Because you're not the hero at the end of the day. Share a story with the kids or your relations that are in your home. Uh, about when you didn't have the strength, the answer or the solution, but you depended on God and how he came through. You've got to tell those stories to your children. Now, my children didn't need to hear the story so much. They saw it happen. And sometimes they will see it happen to us. But, you know, uh, some of the things are hard. You know, I got, I, I got asked after 
a couple of instances where I've been attacked in the past. And I, how, how did you cope with that? And we talked about that in our home. How did I cope with it? Well, I really actually had confidence in God. Because years ago, I'd learned to deal with some of this rough stuff in my own life. And so for me, violence wasn't an issue. The issue for me was not violence. The issue for me <coughs> was, was, um, was um, pretty low level. You see? But for other people, some people said to me, gee whiz, I couldn't have coped with that. And I agree. But it's some things that you could cope with that I might find hard. You know one of the things that really gets at me? <clears throat> it still gets at me, and I've been a Christian a long time. Now and again, when I see parents who have a very loving relationship with their family, it gets in my heart. I, I feel slightly envious. You know? It's harder for me to deal with than a whole bunch of violence. Might, you might find it hard to understand or comprehend, but that's been my life experiences that have caused that to happen, and we're, we are all different. So, in terms of this, <clears throat> we need to set good boundaries if we're going to be great parents. You're going to be great parents, yeah? So, the reason for boundaries is to teach some things. Now, I want to be quick from this point onwards. It teaches self control, it teaches responsibility, it teaches freedom, and it teaches love. You know, if we set good, healthy boundaries, these are not barriers, they're boundaries. There's a big difference. Barriers are things which impact people. Boundaries are different. You see, the truth of the matter is that boundaries always come out of your values. So there's a responsibility. Make sure your values are godly and great because the boundaries you set will come out of your values. And so if your boundaries are angry boundaries, I can tell you now you need to deal with an issue of anger. And it goes on like that. And everything, set, um, <clears throat> how do you talk in, in, the, in the home? And everything, says uh, Paul to Titus, set them an example by doing what is good. And your teachings show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech. So, so you know, this, this is the bottom line. It's in everything, not selective things. In everything, he's talking about having these kinds of attitudes. In terms of the atmosphere in our home, you've got to ask yourself a question when you're, when you're dealing with your children. <clears throat> if I could have the choice, what would I really have loved to experience as a child? And then, and make sure it's godly. <laughs> Otherwise, don't do it. And then help make decisions with your children. In terms of atmosphere in the home, the next thing I want to talk about is attitude of gratitude. Uh, in Colossians 2 verse 7 talks about this, being thankful always. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> the next one, uh, create an environment of, of uh, success. You know, don't, don't, when your child gets a low mark, don't beat up on them for it. Encourage them. And if they tried, they tried. I tried and failed successfully. Trouble is I got told I was useless. And the stupid thing was, when I got top in New Zealand in my trade, you know, I still got told I was useless. There's a default setting in my parents that wasn't good. If we, you know, if I'd been a little bit encouraged, like I became after I became a Christian, I probably would have done huge, in fact, not just probably, I would have done a huge difference at school. Make sure you've got a well-balanced diet. My wife is great at this. If you want to know how to do it and you're not sure, ask her. I'm not going to try and explain it to you. I just eat it. And then the next one, value time together. Value time together. Make sure that you get good value time together and you value it when you do have it. Don't use it to try and talk about something stupid or something tough. Do that intention another time, but value good time together. And then the next thing, the righteous person leads a blameless life. Blessed are their children after them. So the importance of being righteous and living righteously is so, so important. So I want to just give a, a few quick tips, and I'm not going to comment on them. I'm just going to stick them up here to finish off with this morning. Plan time for fun. Never use it as discipline. Never use your fun time as discipline. And same thing, some parents actually discipline their children by saying, well, you're not going to youth or you're not dumb. Let me say it really bluntly, Dumb. As soon as you do that, you're cutting off the discipleship source that's going to help you as parents. Dumb. Find something else to beat up on. But don't, don't undermine the very things that are going to make difference in their lives. 
Never disagree with, about discipline in front of your children. Never, ever disagree. I've actually, I've had to counsel so many children over the years where that's been happening and the consequences in their family are terrible. Be consistent with rewards and discipline. Don't do it differently for one person to the other person in the family. And always the same discipline for the same thing. Don't keep changing it because it creates an unstable environment in the home. Decide with your children what is desirable and not okay so that they are part of the process and it's not you just chucking rules at them. You're actually teaching them to take responsible responsibility and make good decisions by, by getting them involved. Expect that change only happens as fast as you change. And if you're a slow changer, don't expect your child to suddenly change overnight. Tomorrow you're going to be like this. Actually, you know, I'd love to empower your children sometimes. You say to your parent, tomorrow I expect you to be different too. No, only kidding. But that's, that's the, what the child thinks. I'd never dare say it, of course. Teach responsibility and independence. They're not totally independent of you, but teach them how to make some good decisions without you needing to be there. Teach them the processes. And by, uh, you teach them responsibility by giving them responsibility. For goodness sake, those parents who don't give their children chores or work to do around the home, you're asking for trouble. You're teaching them laziness and they won't want to be employed when they get older. Right? Then, own the responsibility of developing children's spirituality, your children's spirituality. Own the responsibility. Don't chuck it off onto the children's church or the youth or whatever. You need to take some responsibility. They'll back you up to the hilt. Make prayer and scripture uh, foundational to your relationship with your children. Make prayer and scripture foundational. Next one. <coughs> um, when we are authentic, vulnerable, and humble. So, you know... You'll have that great family God designed you to be when we have those attitudes. Encu when we encourage and prepare children to use their spiritual gifts, we don't dominate the fi family, allow them to develop theirs. And lastly, model the Christian life. And if you don't know them yet, get to know them because it'll make a huge difference for your kids. And not just here on earth, but in eternity too. I cannot understand, and I've talked with par parents about this, why, why parents don't walk solidly with God, knowing full well that the consequence of that is going to be the, the likelihood is their children will end up going to a place that you would never want your children to go. I could not see my, 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 our three girls in hell. I couldn't bear that thought. You know, when, when Satan has tried to tempt me with something, one of the things that I've thought about, man, if I do that, then my children are going to go to hell. A likely outcome. I just can't do that to them. So, we finish with that, with the message. So, um, let's say t thanks to the team that have given us so much this morning.